Can Islam and democracy coexist? What is the relation between oil and democracy? How has the Arab Spring impacted the discourse and understanding of democratization in the MENA region? I'm Yadna Khavali, and this is Middle East Analytica. Sami, thank you very much for joining the program. Thank you for having me. Uh, what role has political culture played in shaping the perception of democracy among citizens in the Middle East and North Africa? And how has this impacted their engagement in the democ- democratic process? I think that when we talk about democracy in the Middle East, I think it's important to understand the dynamics, the unique dynamics of the Middle East in which democracy is taking place or in which democracy is being pursued. And by that I mean specifically with regards to what values are held in esteem in the Middle East as opposed to the values uh, that are held in esteem in the Western world. The reason why I mention that is because it's important to stress and understand that the primary beneficiaries of the democratic processes in the region thus far have been religious parties, have been parties that have been associated with Islam, parties that have been associated with some sort of perception that is often positive of Islam or of religion generally. And the reason I start with that point is because the idea of democracy in the Western world emerged as part of a secularization or an enlightenment period between quotation marks after the bitter war between Europe and the church. The governments of Europe went to war with the church. They felt the church was overbearing. They felt that Christianity was being used illegitimately. And so they ousted religion from the public and uh, public sphere and relegated it to the private sphere. The Muslim world or the MENA region or North Africa or the Middle East have a very different experience with religion in that there is no equivalent of this war. Even if we look at countries such as Iran or the like where, or, or, or Afghanistan where we're talking about religious authorities, this is a relatively new phenomenon in terms of the negative experience. But overwhelmingly in the mindset or subconscious of this region, there's nothing that is equivalent to the war with the church. And that's why in the first free and fair elections following the Arab Spring, It wasn't necessarily about policies as much as it was about affinity to this identity. And the reason why I've started with this point in answering your question is because the French President Emmanuel Macron reflected the divergence in opinion regarding how democracy played out when he gave an interview to Le Grand Continent in 2020 where he referred to the Arab Spring elections as regressive suggesting that the way the people voted, the idea that an Islamic affinity or religious affinity, let's put it this way, can play a role in the way people vote is a sign of regression. All this indicates that democracy in the Middle East appears to have taken a different form from democracy in the Western world. And the results of democracy in the Middle East are different from the Western world. And that's why we have this very awkward debate now in the Western world as to whether democracy should be supported for a people who, in their words, don't know how to choose. And that's why in the backlash to the Arab Spring, the prevalent narratives were not that democracy is bad, but that the people were not ready for democracy. That if you allow democracy, such as in the New York Times article, The Dark Prince of the UAE, that's the headline. It is said, according to officials, that the UAE told the US that if you allow democracy in this region, you will give rise to parties that believe that a holy book from 1400 years ago should dictate the rules of society and how they should operate. So when we're looking at democracy in the Middle East or the development of the democracy, it's important to highlight that while people have been pushing for it, there's been a dissatisfaction in the Western world amongst many people as to the results that democracy has produced. And now we have this very awkward turn in which it's almost as if authoritarianism is preferred to a democracy that doesn't produce the results that we don't like, or that democracy is only acceptable if it is based on the values of a different history from that of the region itself. Right, right. Um, Okay, uh, you mentioned Iran, you mentioned Islam. So let me ask you this. If you remember the uh, president of Iran, Mohammad Khatami, was speaking about the coexistence of Islam and democracy. 
So let me ask your opinion on this. Can Islam and democracy coexist? And uh, what are the differing vi- viewpoints on the relationship between Islam and democracy? I think that often when this issue is tackled, we focus a lot in terms of the framework, the idea of an Islamic framework or a democratic framework. But we forget the reason why democracy emerged in the first place or why Islam emerged in the first place. And that was to bring tangible change to the lives of ordinary people. It was to elevate people out of poverty. It was to provide a means through which there could be social engagement and consensus that would allow for space to implement measures that would improve the lives of the people. The reason I start with that answer is because the reason we have a coup in Tunisia today in which we don't see people on the streets protesting against this is because Tunisia had a democracy in so far as people could vote, in so far as there was free speech, in so far as there was free political participation. It had all of those elements of democracy. But in 10 years, people got poorer. The economy did not move. People became frustrated. People said to themselves, we voted for three different parliaments. We've had three different presidents. Each time the parties tell us the same thing and nothing is improving. And that created an environment of apathy that led to a coup in which now when you go to Tunisia and tell them go and restore your democratic transition, they tell you what did the democratic transition deliver for me so that I should go out in the streets and fight for it. And that's why I believe that Tunisia was mired in this debate as to where democracy and Islam correspond with each other without understanding that they are means to an end, they are means to achieve something. And ironically, this is why, even if I disagree with the argument, this is why when the UAE revolted against the Arab Spring or when there was a push against the Arab Spring, what the UAE was arguing was that the people do not want democracy, the people do not want Islam, the people do what people want is food and wealth and prosperity. If you deliver that, they won't care what kind of governance there is or what kind of system rules. I believe that human dignity stands for something and that's why the argument is wrong. But the reason why I emphasize that is because Islam and democracy share share very similar traits. Islam believes in shura, that people should be engaged, they should talk about their affairs and the like, and democracy believes that everybody should have engagement and active participation. But if democracy doesn't produce the prosperity that it promises, what we end up seeing is that democracy only works if people believe in it, and people will believe in it if it delivers the prosperity. And if it doesn't, then we see the apathy in Tunisia, then we see the apathy in Algeria, then we see these countries where you had the democracy emerging, but without the results that it was expected to produce. So when Khatami talked about Islam and democracy, he talked about it from the perspective that there is nothing wrong with the expression of an Islamic identity as long as there is a consensus about it in society. Of course, this has been abused in many different societies and the like, but I would also flip it in that the assertion that Islam should be relegated and democracy should replace it instead, has led to this backlash that we see in the region in which we see a preference for authoritarianism. This idea being that when France says that we want democracy that doesn't produce Islam, what effectively we're saying is that we will not allow the people to choose until they choose what we want. In effective, in effective forms, it's a dictatorship, even though it is under a democratic lens. But that's why I think the debate about democracy and Islam, and I'll finish on this point, the debate about democracy and Islam over the past 10 years, what has been demonstrated is that it's an irrelevant debate in if people are getting poorer and it doesn't provide. Democracy is a means, not an end. And I think as long as we continue to talk about it as an end, we will have consequences like we have in Tunisia. Uh, Sami, you mentioned Arab Spring. Okay, let's focus on this. We know that uh, Arab Spring impacted the discourse and understanding of democratization, especially in the context of Muslim-majority countries. Uh, today, after more than a decade, uh, what insights have been gained from analyzing democratic transitions in the MENA region? I think what has been abundantly clear is that advocates of democracy only support them democracy in so far as their allies are the beneficiaries or their allies are the ones that win. When we look at the coups that took place in Egypt or in Tunisia, we saw that they were overwhelmingly liberal 
coups. They were liberals taking to the streets, frustrated that they could not convince the people to vote for them, frustrated that despite support from Paris, from Washington, from these other think tanks or the like, despite their assertion about liberal values or the like, the people overwhelmingly rejected them at the ballot box because they favored an affinity towards something that leaned more towards religious values or the like. What we learned is that the international community is hesitant to support democracy as a framework if it produces results that they don't like or values that perhaps they have an aversion to. And this is why we saw that instead of trying to restore the democratic processes, we saw recognition of coups because according to Western diplomats, the assertion of the Muslim Brotherhood parties that their majority win in elections means that they can implement their policies in the way that the Conservative Party here in the UK implement as they wish when they win elections, the way Biden implements policies as he wishes when he wins an election, that rule should not apply to the region even if they win a majority in the elections. I think the lessons from the Arab Spring was that people like the idea of popular revolution and people having democracy, but they are very uncomfortable when the reality becomes a reality and people actually choose and people find that people actually have an opinion that is not necessarily the same opinion as Paris and London. And then there is a scramble. How do we react to that? How do we adapt to that? Do we engage in dialogue, which is what democracy demands, or do we support military coups and send in military bases because we don't trust these people because if they choose for themselves they will choose independence and if they choose independence it threatens the global order if it threatens the global order it threatens hegemony and we prefer a system in which our values are supreme the lessons from the arab spring was in that there is there was a dramatic betrayal of the people who took to the streets by the international community. The people who believe that if we have democracy, we will get support from the Western world, they were emphatically let down by an international community that turned around and said, we don't like the way you voted, it's regressive and it's backwards, and therefore we're disinclined to support your democracy and we will not support it until you make the correct choices. And I think that's the tragedy and the heartbreak of the Arab Spring. There are revisionists who are trying to paint the Arab Spring as a Muslim Brotherhood revolution. But I was in Egypt when Morsi was being elected. I was in Egypt during the elections before Morsi was elected. And when you talk to people, they didn't care about policy. They didn't care about Muslim Brotherhood. They didn't care about Morsi. What they cared about was being able to manifest their vote in a way that aligned with their values or a way that aligned with their affinity. Right or wrong is irrelevant. America voted Donald Trump and accepted it. And then the he kicked out Donald Trump and they brought in Joe Biden. There was no coup, there was no interference, no military bases. We consider it a mistake, they consider it a democratic process. But this, these dynamics were not applicable to the Middle East. So I think the greatest lesson or the most important lesson of the Arab Spring is not that the region is not ready for democracy, but that the world is not ready for democracy in the region. Right. Um, now another question is uh, mostly refers to... Um, oil-rich countries. We know that uh, some of these countries in these regions are oil-rich, but um, again, we see that they have many democratic challenges. For example, Iran, for example, Saudi Arabia. So in your opinion, what's the relationship between oil and democracy? I think that there's often a, a desire to simplify the, the systems of governance in those countries, particularly the monarchies, in the Middle East and to essentially state that their power stems from oil. But if you take Saudi Arabia, for example, the formation of the modern Saudi Arabian kingdom was a man called Abdelaziz al Saud who took Riyadh by force and then managed to win the consensus of the tribes by agreeing to divide the resources between them and they acknowledged him as the ruler of Saudi Arabia and given the way society was at the time and that it was very tribal, the tribal elders when they came to an agreement that established the stability, a social contract that has continued and that's why Saudi Arabia often argues that it's different from other countries because the emergence of its social contract was very different from the emergence of say Europe or the like. I think it has less to do with oil and more to do with the unique dynamics of society. The UAE, for example, emerged as a state, albeit there was a role in the British uh, taking a role in, in, in helping the UAE to establish itself. 
But more to the point, the UAE came about as a result of an alliance of seven or eight tribes who came together and agreed to rotate the presidency between them, and that established the social contract. It had less to do with oil and more to do with the way the society operated. There is an argument to be made that society has changed since then. It's no longer tribal. There shouldn't be a new form of system. But I think that often there is a lack of nuance in understanding how these systems have emerged, particularly when we're talking about about democracy. Saudi Arabia has this idea of bayah and the Saudis argue and the Qataris argue legitimately, even if I disagree with the system, they argue legitimately that there is a consensus among society that people are prospering, that people are happy with it. It may not be something you like, but it works for us. I think perhaps there is room for debate regarding this discussion. I think Iran is slightly different, however, primarily because of the dynamics of the 1979 revolution and the promises that Khomeini made in 1979, which was the suggestion that the Shah has gone and we're going to restore some sort of democratic uh, republic or democratic system. And it ended up into a very awkward Wilayat al system in which Iranians vote for a president, but the main power lies with Khamenei or lies with the guy at the top who has the power to overrule the presidency. I think with Iran, it was more a case of a social contract was offered, but the reality of the social contract was very different from that which was originally promised. And that's why we always see this upheaval in Iran in terms of how the governance should be and what are the dynamics of the governance that should be. I do think that the issue has far less to do with oil. I think what oil has done is enable a wealth that has appeased the population and enabled the governments to buy out the population. For example, when there are floods in Jeddah and many homes are destroyed, the royal palace releases funds or money to the victims that makes the victims feel, OK, I got a huge payout. I won't criticize as much as I, as I should criticize over the failure to build proper homes that can survive floods. I think the oil money helped to uphold a social contract that would have otherwise collapsed under the changes that take place within society in and of themselves. But in terms of democracy or the like in those regions or in oil countries in particular, I do think that there should be a greater appreciation of the nuances of the social contract because only with an appreciation of those nuances will you be able to see the opportunities for democracy. Right. Um, let's now talk precisely about the role of United States and its involvement in the MENA democratization process. How can lessons uh, learned from preventing and reversing democratic backsliding be applied to MENA to ensure more sustainable and resilient democratization process? That's a very difficult question. I think that one of the things that is worth noting, and it is a very controversial example, and people will be upset that I use this example, but I use it because it is one of the only countries that still maintains a strong democratic institution, albeit not as democratic as it used to be, and that is Turkey. If you look at Erdogan's consistent winning in the elections, even though people dislike him, even though he has transgressed on issues with human rights or the like, there is no denying that he has won those elections almost freely, that Turks have gone to the elections and voted for Erdogan, and even if they haven't voted for Erdogan because they love Erdogan, because they're more they're scared of the opposition or they don't trust the opposition, nevertheless, Erdogan wins at the ballot box. And the reason that Erdogan wins at the ballot box is for two reasons. The first is that Erdogan in 2003 to 2011 did something that the Tunisians didn't do or the Tunisian parties didn't do, which is actually build infrastructure, which is actually build airports in, in neglected areas, build roads in neglected areas. People were able to see tangible development. And I remember many Turks who hated Erdogan's Islamist leanings, but would go and vote Erdogan and you would ask them why. And they would say, because he does a good job with the economy. The economy is what speaks. We like the economy and we hope that he won't implement his Islamist agenda. The point here being is that Erdogan managed to win enough credit for people to continue voting for him. The second dynamic that helped Erdogan was this perception that that before Erdogan, the secular parties were very brutal. They brutalized swathes of the population, very anti-religion, very anti-Islam, anti the, the religious Turks who made up more than 40% of the population. There was this idea that even if we don't like Erdogan, those guys are worse, so I'm going to vote for Erdogan. 
in many ways, it's very similar to the UK where, you know, for example, we have the choice between Labour and Conservatives. People don't like Labour too much. They don't like the Conservatives. With If people vote Labour, it's all because they hate the Conservatives, not because they like the Labour government. But the reason why I mention that is that the lesson is not necessarily that we learn from the United States, but the lesson can be learned from Turkey in that if you do a good job, people will mobilize to protect you. If you do a decent job economically and people feel like they have a stake in the country, they will mobilize to protect your democracy. If you look at Pakistan, Imran Khan was toppled in a clear maneuver by the establishment because they disagreed over who should appoint the successor to the army chief for staff. Thousands of people took to the streets and the establishment is struggling to imprison Imran Khan. And this is why I said that democracy works when people believe in it. If people believe that their vote counts, if they believe that their vote has produced a tangible result, such as airports in Gaziantep or roads in Shanurfa or, or, or a new Kurdish channel for Diyarbakar and Van and these places, then people will take to the streets as they did in 2016 to stop a coup on a democratically elected government. It's not about whether you like the government or not. It's about I have voted, do I see results? And the Turks believe that they saw results. And that's why they protect their democracy. In a way that the Iranians or other, other countries don't are not necessarily don't have that affinity for a democracy that they believe is always rigged, that the choices are always decided beforehand. That, and that's why I think in Tunisia, people haven't taken to the streets, but in Turkey and Pakistan, they did. So the lessons that we can learn is less about what the Western states can do and more about what the political actors in the region can do. If you deliver for your people when they give you the chance, they will take to the streets to protect you when the US and France want to topple you because they don't like your leanings. If you win the people over, and that's where another in Tunisia failed, that even though the people delivered them to power, they didn't trust the power of the people. They were always scared that the US or the France would support a coup. They forgot the power comes from the people. And that's why I think that the lessons that can be learned is the ultimate power comes from the win the people and not even Washington can intervene and topple your government. That's what Turkey has demonstrated. That's what Imran Khan is trying to demonstrate in Pakistan. And that's the lessons that should be learned in the region with regards to democracy. Democracy is ruled from the people. The power stems from the people. If you believe in that and the people have a stake in it, they are the most powerful defense against any international conspiracy. So I think you're a believer that you believe that democracy can be established in the manner without external intervention. Let, let, let me ask you about... Uh, China and Russia's involvement. Um, we know that the alliance which is taking place between these two superpowers is called as an alliance of autocracies. How do you see the role of these superpowers? For example, I can I can tell you um, as an Iranian who was in many protests in Iran, uh, I can tell you that it was almost impossible to change the regime in, in Tehran. So because, because, for example, they know that they have this support from, from the superpowers like Russia and China and U.S. had done nothing about that. How do you see this? How do you see these external superpowers who are uh, empowering uh, out the autocracies in the MENA region? I think that one of the things that is worth noting, China and Russia support autocracies and they're willing to deploy their military weight to, and, and we've seen it in Syria where Russian planes rescued the Assad regime. We've seen, for example, that China continues to support Iran economically. We've seen that China is lending itself as an alternative to the US for Saudi Arabia and the UAE in order for them to squeeze Washington. They're saying to Washington, we'll go to China if you don't respect our right to be autocratic and our right to be authoritarian if you keep insisting on human rights. We'll just go to China, which doesn't care about human rights. I think that when it comes to the Iran example, and I will say something very controversial and uh, it will upset many people, but I do think that the Iranian protest, let's take the last one, for example, over the Kurdish girl who was killed by the police because she wasn't wearing the headscarf properly. I think that there was a sweeping uh, dissipation of sympathy, a sweeping uh, a removal of sympathy for many of these protests when the symbol of it became the burning of the hijab. I think when when the videos and pictures and the symbol of those protests became the burning of the hijab, 
It ended up being seen as a Western ideological push to topple the Iranian regime, even though it wasn't. There were many in the region who really wanted to see these protests succeed, who suddenly felt like, wait, this looks a bit too much. I, I can support the protest, but not this. This this is a bit too much because the, the symbol that reflects my identity is being burned. So I'm caught between this bad regime and these people who will bring something that is averse to the values that I hold dear. And I go back to this idea of the elections that produce religious parties winning. And I think often when the Iranian protests take place, there is this sentiment in that when in in that the regional sympathies are with the protest in the beginning and then end up lacking because of the idea that they might produce a model that is not in line with the region. Regardless, that doesn't that, that's not something that Iranians want to hear or but but that's something that at least with the hijab protest it 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 clearly happened. There were many journalists sympathetic and then they felt that France's excitement at the burning of the hijab, that US's excitement, that for them it was more about the removal of Islam than about Iranian freedom. People can support Iranian freedom, but but anyway, the the point here is that when we talk about China and Russia or or people power and democracy, I think China and Russia are averse to democracy in the region. That's hundred percent true. They thrive when there are dictatorships. But I also think that Russia and China lack the capacity for regime change in the way that the U.S. has demonstrated before. When people talk about Russian-supported coups in Niger or in Gabon or these places, these aren't Russian supporters. These are people, popular protests that took place against French military presence in the countries. And the army felt that as a result of the people protesting in the streets, we can mobilize and we can overthrow that government. I think when we look at Iranian protests, there's often people on the streets, but not enough resonance amongst elements of the regime revolutionary guard or the other institutions that might be able to channel that into actually making change. And I think a lot of that has to do with ideology than about the actual pressures that take place. Is it possible with Chinese and Russian support? I think China and Russia are willing to exert some support for a regime, but I think they are very pragmatic. If they feel a regime cannot survive the popular protest, they are quicker than the US in withdrawing their particular support. So I do have hope for democracy. Even in Iran, I have hope for democracy in and of itself. But I do think that as long as Iran in particular, or indeed the other countries, even Tunisia and the like, as long as the divide is secular and religious, I think we're condemned to an environment in which the international actors can play a part. The liberals in Egypt, they sought out the US to help them with a coup against a democratically elected president. And their religious parties saw, sought out Qatar and Turkey and these others in order to help them. But I think that for the people, and this is why I go back to this point in the first question, when I said that it's less about Islam and democracy and more about the end goal, improving people's lives. I think if you put that as the focus, the improvement of people's lives away from the ideological movements a bit, I think you'll win the buy-in of more that can actually bring about that change. Having said that, change is hard, change is difficult, power is never given, power is always taken. But I do think that when you look at the protest in Iran, when you look at the Arab Spring, I think given this was a region 80 years ago, was under official colonization. And then the colonizers couldn't stay anymore because they were kicked out by independence movements. And then we had semi-colonization, dictatorships, authoritarians. I think the trajectory overall is going towards one of freedom. And I think you mentioned the Iran example. I think the Iranian regime, part of its willingness to talk to Saudi and make concessions and part of its willingness to talk to the US is because it's terrified that the larger the protests are getting, the weaker the regime is becoming. Um, thank you for bringing back hope to this podcast. As with almost all of the analysts that I talk with, they call the Arab Spring as uh, Arab Autumn or Arab Winter, <laughs> but now I feel pretty better. Um, as um, the war between Russia and Ukraine is the trend, I have to ask you your opinion about the um, this conflict and its impact on the MENA region's democratic landscape. I think that the greatest impact that it's had is that it's enabled or it's brought home the idea that MENA region states do have strategic autonomy. The overwhelming position of MENA states is that this is a Western affair. It doesn't have much to do with us. 
This is a problem between you and Russia. It doesn't have any, we don't have a stake in it. We're willing to mediate between you, but we're not willing to intervene on one side or the other. US talks about it, the global order being under threat. The MENA states are saying that the only people who benefit from this global order is America and Europe. The rest of the world is suffering from this global order. So that's not resonating either. And as a result, we're seeing the US suddenly scramble to try to find a way, a different message to communicate with the global south or with the MENA regions to say to them, okay, you're not happy with the global order, but here's why you should still help us with Ukraine. While the MENA states are saying, look, I have Russia, which is involved in Syria, Libya, and these other places, and I have the US involved in Iraq or the like. What do I gain from putting myself on the US side when the US has shown a propensity to betray me when I really need them? And what benefit do I gain from going on the Russian side when the Russian side also show a propensity to betray movements when they desperately need to? I think that what Ukraine has done more in terms of its impact on democracy in the MENA region, it's that it's it's highlighted that the world is bigger than America, is bigger than Europe, and is bigger than Russia. That there are so that the world is much more diverse, much more expansive, and that these powers do have the ability to exert autonomy. The question here is, can we channel that autonomy someday into something that benefits the people of the region? I think we can. And I think there are changes in the region and signs that we are moving towards it. But I think that even if Ukrainians will be upset at hearing it, I sympathize greatly with the Ukrainians on this, not with the Russians. But from a strictly political angle, I think that what the Ukrainian war has demonstrated is that while the U.S. may not like the democratic choices that the people will make in the MENA region, certainly autonomy and resources exist in the region that, if used properly, can help us to resist the Western antagonism towards the choices that the people choose to make at the ballot box. Sami, thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Mia. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for watching and listening to us. Please don't forget to subscribe.